Okay, so for those of you who just joined in in the past few minutes, I, um, Dr. Zine Sedigian, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm a clinical associate professor at Tulane University, and we're going to be talking about atopic dermatitis today, courtesy of the Visual DX Clinical Education Series. And this is a, a wonderful webinar series. I don't know if you've ever caught some of the other ones, but they're very high yield and useful for a lot of providers who are seeing you know, some interesting visual rashes and just want more insight on how to make a diagnosis and manage it. So today we're going to talk about atopic dermatitis. We'll start with the case. So we have a 19-year-old male who presents as a new patient with dermatitis, meaning rash affecting the neck, torso, and extremities. The rash is pruritic, which means itchy, red, and scaling. The itch disrupts his sleep. He is currently using Irish Spring Soap and taking two showers a day. The patient is also currently using Neosporin cream as needed, but he's not getting any relief. His review system is significant for allergic rhinitis and a history of asthma, which you could also say is part of his past medical history. So, and the reason why we include in that review system, some patients won't endorse that they have a history of seasonal allergies in their medical history or asthma, but if you pry into the review system, they'll endorse that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the incidence and epidemiology of atopic dermatitis and see if this case kind of fits. So the majority of cases do present in children with the highest prevalence in early infancy and childhood. So about 5 to 20% of children worldwide or approximately 11% of cases occur um, in children in the U.S. and 85% are in the first year of life and 95% occur before the age of 5. You can have periods of complete remission, particularly during adolescence, and or you may have periods of waxing and waning throughout life. It used to, we used to think that kids outgrew their atopic dermatitis, but we're seeing that a lot of cases do recur early in adult life, or they may have persistent sensitivities in adult life. 3% is the rate of frequency in adults, but onset may be delayed until adulthood. And this is, we're going to talk more about this in detail because I think we need to be very cautious when you're diagnosing somebody with atopic dermatitis in adulthood. The data of frequency in adults is limited and uh, mostly based on self-administered questionnaire information. So the incidence and epidemiology of atopic dermatitis will vary study to study and based off of what areas you're polling. So we do think that the incidence of atopic dermatitis is increasing. There may be a slight predilection towards females being diagnosed with atopic dermatitis. And in the U.S., we do think there is a higher incidence in urban areas. In the international arena, though, there has been a higher incidence developing in countries um, such as Western societies. Uh, we also know that in some of the Asian countries, particularly Eastern Asia, uh, in Africa, Western Europe, and Northern parts of Europe, there may be an increasing trend as well. So what are some risk factors we, of atopic dermatitis? We know that emotional stress is one, inappropriate bathing habits, such as multiple showers, prolonged showers, hot showers, or Harsh detergents, which are irritants, uh, can predispose or exacerbate atopic dermatitis. An underlying infection can also cause a flare in atopic dermatitis. Certain environments and climate zones can predispose. Sweating in some patients, they'll endorse that sweating makes them itchier or more pruritic and tends to flare their atopic dermatitis and sometimes environmental allergens as well. There are associated atopic diagnoses associated with this. So our atopic triad, you can have your allergic rhinitis, asthma, and atopic dermatitis tend to cluster with each other. There are a lot of patients who tend to have food allergies, whether or not this is related to their atopic dermatitis or not. There are also ocular manifestations associated with atopic dermatitis, and we'll review those. And there are newer emerging comorbidities. As I said earlier in our introduction, we kind of have this new phase of research coming through for atopic dermatitis, and we're starting to see comorbidities, that this is not just a skin-only disease, but rather a condition, uh, the atopic diathesis probably expands further than what our 
previous just trio was uh, and that we're starting to get more comorbidities such as suicidal ideation, ADD, mental health issues, sleep loss, things like that. So we'll go into that uh, briefly. Also, family history of atopy and mutations in the flagrin gene are strongly associated risk factors for atopic dermatitis, but there are also numerous other genetic defects that are emerging right now for atopic dermatitis. We know it is a barrier defect disease, but also immune disease. And so patients who have epidermal barrier dysfunction that's inherited are predisposed to getting this. And that is where flagrin and some gene mutations uh, will play in fact, but also we see that there's immune dysregulation and that could also play a fact into this. So what's our patient's differential, the case study that we did earlier? So you can see here the summary of the case. And, you know, we can think of CTCL. Uh, I want you to think about this anytime that you have an older patient, maybe not 19 years old, but let's say somebody in their 50s or 60s with an eczematous dermatitis, also allergic contact dermatitis is another dermatitis. I apologize. Do you guys hear something on the line? Okay. Yes, I'm, uh, we're trying to mute everybody. Um, as you know, okay. I'm making sure that everyone's muted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and just let me know if it's coming from my office. Okay, allergic contact dermatitis is another consideration. That's where you're actually allergic to something coming in contact with the skin. And allergic contact dermatitis can be very subtle. It's not always as obvious as poison ivy. Irritant contact dermatitis is another thing to consider. And so these are sometimes, uh, this can occur when somebody is coming in contact with very basic substances, harsh cleansers, um, or airborne irritants. Tinea corporis, which is a fungal infection, can look eczematous at times, and it can be very subtle. And especially in infants, it can uh, not necessarily get your class, you may not get your classic annular scaling plaque. Psoriasis. This is one that typically we can tell the difference between atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, but occasionally you do have to biopsy because you may have like a very um, ill-defined diffuse dermatitis and you just need a little bit of help clarifying. Pityriasis rosea, which is a viral infection, that can be eczematous appearing at times, but typically the distribution is completely different and you should be able to differentiate it. And also you should get your classic Herald patch. You should start getting lesions kind of pop up on the torso and your Christmas tree pattern distribution. You shouldn't necessarily have confusion with this, but there are always atypical cases, right? Seborrheic dermatitis. That can definitely be in a differential. You can get seborrheic dermatitis um, outside of the scalp and face. It can occur on the chest and back. You don't typically see it on the extremities. Lichen simplex chronicus, I think this is going to be one um, where sometimes you, you may not necessarily have two separate diagnoses. You can definitely have someone who's atopic or has a previous underlying dermatitis and they just keep scratching, and then eventually, as their skin becomes lichenified, you're setting up shop for LSD. So lichen simplex chronicus means that there's no active, necessarily, inflammation dermatitis going on to explain the itch cycle, but rather it's probably a chronic rubbing factor that is causing them to, to continue to itch, and so that's why you get a focal lesion. Lichen simplex chronicus does tend to be focal lesions, and your parigo nodules will be more um, nodular lesions. Ichthyosis vulgaris is a condition where you are basically, you have very dry skin, and it tends to be inherited, and this condition can predispose you to developing an eczema. Scabies, as we know, is an infectious etiology. It'll be an abrupt onset. It's going to have your circle of Hebra distribution, and so you're going to see it in areas under the arms, the uh, interdigital web spaces, genital areas, um, around the umbilicus, and even lower extremities. Glucoconoma syndrome, very rare. And I do not anticipate that this will ever be in your differential, but for academic purposes, you can get an eczematous dermatitis, although in its severe form, glucogonoma syndrome should be similar to a necrolytic um, migratory erythema, and you should not have 
any confusion. And then pellagra, which is our niacin deficiency, you can get a photosensitive dermatitis, uh, but you'll usually pellagra, you'll have a different distribution and you'll other ha you'll have other symptoms going on with some of these systemic conditions like leukoconoma syndrome and pellagra. You you should have systemic symptoms going on. So for example with pellagra you'll be getting diarrhea and dementia. It's you know the patient's not going to be well. So all right, let's talk about our physical exam findings in our case. On physical exam our patient has erythematous eczematous scaling plaques on the the neck the bilateral flank, volar wrist, the antecubital and popliteal fossa. Pay attention to these locations because these are pathognomonic. Open excoriations are noted overlying most plaques. And the patient has periorbital pallor, prominent infraorbital creases, and a nasal crease. And the reason why we put this in the physical exam is because a lot of your eczema patients will present in a typical manner. You do have atypical presentations as well, but there are so many clues on the physical exam outside of just your, your dermatitis that should be able to help you with your physical exam findings. So here we can review the clinical images. In the antecubital fossa, you can see that this patient does have erythematous eczematous scaling plaques. Now, the scale is going to be different than psoriasis. Psoriasis is not going to be on the, in the antecubital fossa. It's going to be on the extensor surfaces, and you're going to get a thicker lesion and a thicker scale, more of a white micaceous or silver scale. And for, for atopic dermatitis, you tend to get more almost um, – Sometimes you can get macerated lesions um, or more papular lesions. They have a different look to them. Here you can kind of see that these plaques are excoriated. And I, I typically see my patients have excoriated lesions. It's not very common that I see something that hasn't been scratched over. These patients are really itchy when they're seeing you for the first time. And that's oftentimes why, when they come to see you is They've already tried numerous over-the-counter lotions and creams, and nothing's really helping. But granted, I do have a referral bias. I am probably seeing patients who have also failed, um, you know, early medical management with outside providers as well. And we can see here that the the sides of the um, the neck are involved. So let's look at some differential images and kind of talk about the difference. So A, this is going to be your CTCL. Like I said, if you have an adult patient who's presenting with new atopic dermatitis, you really need to have this in the back of your head because this is the number one mimicker and it can be very confusing. And this is, you know, something we need to catch because this is a skin lymphoma. So we don't want to assume somebody, you know, a 50 or 60 year old gentleman, for example, has new onset eczema and just brush it under the rug. We need to roll out CTCL. And oftentimes we will biopsy this if we're concerned about CTCL to make sure there's no atypia in the skin biopsy. But you can get reniform eczematous plaques, and they're typically in areas that are double covered or not exposed to the sun. So your area of distribution can be different with your CTCL. Like I said, it's gonna be under clothing. It's not seeing any sun versus your atopic dermatitis it, a lot of times you will get it, even if a person's out in t-shirts all the time, they're still going to get it in certain areas. So B, we have our allergic contact dermatitis. And how you know is hopefully you can glean some pearls from their history. They should maybe tell you like they started some product in it, you know, or like a new product. Sometimes it's not a new product, it's an old product that they've been using for years and all of a sudden they're starting to break out with the rash. But you see these little streaks. I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but these little streaks are your clue that it's something coming from the outside, okay? And a lot of times you'll have geometric edematous uh, plaques, or they may be vesiculated in severe cases, meaning that they're, they're starting to blister. And so typically with atopic dermatitis, you don't get those streaks. And you won't get blisters unless if they have a superficial viral infection. See, this is an irritant contact dermatitis. Now, you can see this gentleman has facial involvement too. And he has, you can tell that this is something coming from the outside. This is an irregular shape, okay? This is also, I would consider somewhat geometric. There's like a straight line here and there's a streak here. 
The fact that he also has some facial involvement is concerning for, is this like an airborne, like cement can sometimes be airborne for people who are cement workers as an irritant dermatitis, or is he coming in contact with like a caustic chemical of some sort? That can be the case. We will see a lot of hand eczemas that are actually exacerbated by irritants as well. So sometimes there can be overlap. Here is a baby who has tinea corporis, a little fungal infection. And the clue here is that this may be subtle. This might not be your classic ringworm appearance, but it, there is a sharp line of demarcation here. And this is probably the advancing edge of the tinea corporis. And this should be your clue right here, okay? Eczema usually doesn't have that very sharp cut off, but it can. And sometimes you need to keep this in the back of your head if you're, you're you know, possibly if somebody had tinea corporis that was misdiagnosed as eczema and they were treated with topical steroids, that can definitely uh, cloud the picture for, for the dermatitis and you won't have that classic annular finding. Here is psoriasis. Now this may be in a situation like this a little bit more confusing, especially around the ear. You know, eczema patients can't, there is regional ear eczema uh, that can be confusing with either subderm or psoriasis. And as you can see here, it's a little different. Typically, you want to look for your psoriasis patients. Look for areas that are kind of going to be your home run areas. Look at the back of the scalp. You know, look for thick micaceous scale around the ears, the elbows, the knees, the sacrum. And these could be your clues. Look at nails. Um, you know, psoriasis patients and eczema patients can't get nail findings, but typically with psoriasis, they can be more profound, and you can get a necolysis or the nail lifting. Both of them, you can get pitting, but you tend to see it more with psoriasis patients. And then lastly, here's our pityriasis rosea. You'll typically see this in um, adolescents or young adults, uh, springtime prevalence, and you can see that you have these erythematous um, round scaling thin plaques, and you can say that they're eczematous. They typically have a, um, a stereotypical distribution, this Christmas tree pattern, although some, some populations tend to get atypical presentations, including African Americans or even younger populations. You will typically have a herald patch, so they'll, they might notice that this or this was the first lesion. I bet you it's somewhere on the other side because these two are similar, but it'll be a very, you know, a larger plaque, and that was like their first lesion, and then they started developing this rash. All right, we'll look at some other differentials. So, seborrheic dermatitis, um, you know, this, this area is classic for subderm. You know, you kind of get this xerotic scaling appearance. In African Americans, you can get hypopigmentation as well. And some people, you just get um, erythema or like a greasy scale. It likes the nasolabial folds, the eyebrows, it likes the scalp and the chest. Um, one thing that we typically don't see in atopic dermatitis is involvement of this nasal crease or close to the nose. That area is typically spared in atopic dermatitis. And if you're going to have facial involvement, it tends to be more lateral to the cheeks. Here we see lichen simplex chronicus. So this person may have had a predisposing um, reason to have scratch in the first place, itch and scratch in the first place, but then it became a sick, like a cycle that they couldn't break. Uh, they may not have had any rash there. It could have been just maybe they had an altered sensation in their skin and it was causing them to, to constantly itch that area. Eventually the skin becomes thickened and like kinified and it kind of entraps around the nerves and they keep signaling itch and they keep scratching the same area over and over again. C is ichthyosis vulgaris. We can see these this uh, characteristic scale. And you typically see it in areas um, on the anterior legs. And this type of scale kind of just get it, it's the perfect clue that this is their inherited condition. Now, these patients can get eczema on top of their ichthyosis. Ichthyosis just means that they have uh, dry skin and they don't have all the proteins that they need to, to form their proper skin barrier. So in D, this is scabies. Babies don't get normal scabies distribution all the time, just their skin doesn't read the textbook. So, you know, if you have, um, you know, just atypical lesions in an atypical area and you have these very papular juicy lesions, think about scabies. This baby is covered in papules and they're just all over, okay? 
E, this is the glucogonoma syndrome. Uh, typically you get in the textbooks, you will get necrolytic migratory erythema, which has a, a scalloped or arcuate migratory, uh, dis it's just a textbook kind of image. I'm trying to describe it with my words, but it'll have a scalloped or arcuate plaque uh, pathology and it'll it'll migrate. And sometimes it can vesiculate and this is typically associated with weight loss, new onset diabetes, and diarrhea. This would be very mild right here. And so, yeah, I could see why, you know, you want to include this in the differential, but this is going to be very rare and uncommon. And lastly, here's pellagra. And we talked about pellagra earlier, and this is going to be in a more photodistributed distribution, uh, but I don't think you will confuse these latter two by any means with atopic dermatitis. So what's the diagnosis for our case? I think we can seal the deal on atopic dermatitis. The patient had uh, periorbital pallor, uh, you know, seasonal allergies is what we were kind of, you know, also that was in the uh, review of systems. And that's kind of giving you a clue that he's atopic to some extent and the asthma as well. And also his skin findings, his distribution was classic for atopic dermatitis. So what are some important symptoms and features? The hallmark symptom is incessant bruitis, itching. So the scratching can lead to lichenification or skin thickening. Now, lichenification is not lichen simplex chronicus, okay? Lichenification is a, just a finding when you get any chronic dermatitis and you keep scratching. You're having increased transepidermal water loss and secondary bacterial infections that can present because you don't have the proper skin barrier. So a lot of our therapies are designed at repairing the skin barrier first and then controlling the inflammation. There's different categories of atopic dermatitis. You can have an acute phase where you're just very erythematous. You might have vesicles. You could have weeping and crusting. I've never really clinically seen bulla in atop atopic dermatitis. Um, subacute, you can get scaly plaques, papules, uh, you can even get erosions and crust. Anytime you see yellow crust, um, you want to be concerned about an infection. Also, chronic eczema is another category where you can get the thickening, the lichenification, scaling, hyper and hypopigmentation. So some people get pigment dropout, especially in darker skin types. You'll notice that the fronts of their legs tend to um, form almost these little white or hypo to depigmented macules, or as the inflammation clears up, the, it resolves with hypopigmented um, patches. So there are many more categories than this. Uh, I think this is more your temporal time frame, is it acute, subacute, or chronic? But there are other categories, such as regional eczema. So we have um, hand dermatitis, head and neck dermatitis, nipple eczema, things like that. So body location, I think this is very important for making your diagnosis. Body location varies depending on age. So in infants, they get a different distribution. You can get um, the weepy cheeks. You can get scalp involvement. Um, the neck creases can be involved. You can get torso involvement. And it can involve the extensor aspects of the arms and legs. And it can be quite widespread. The reason why we think the extensor aspect of the arms and legs happens instead of the antecubital fossa and popliteal fossa is probably due to the fact that infants aren't mobile yet. They may be crawling around um, and exposing those areas to different allergens. Toddlers and older children will start to change their distribution. So this is when you're starting to get flexures of the elbows and the knees. You can start to get wrists and ankles. It can become more generalized. And then you, you're going to notice that the eczema becomes a little bit drier and more lichenified. So you're kind of losing the weepy aspect of it. And so you're not getting the weepy cheeks anymore. You're getting more of the, the dry eczematous um, plaques in the in a cube and popliteal fossa. Adolescents and adults frequently can get regional forms of eczemas, and they can get face and neck eczema or hand eczema. I feel that a lot of our patients who have been diagnosed with eczema or atopic dermatitis when they were younger, when they get older, they tend to have just sensitive skin problems. They are better at managing it, but I don't think that everyone basically 
grows up and then they're done with their atopic dermatitis. I do think that they retain some of that skin sensitivity and it's not uncommon for them to have a flare here and there in their young adulthood. So in darker skin types, sometimes we see a follicular pattern that might be more prevalent, such as a follicular prominence. And this can be more evident with uh, the African-American population or any of our darker Fitzpatrick types. Okay, so for additional symptoms and features, uh, some important features that can help support your atopic dermatitis diagnosis is your early age of onset, personal or family history of atopic dermatitis or any atopic disease such as seasonal allergies or asthma. You can also have IgE reactivity in dry skin. There are also additional features that can help suggests atopic dermatitis diagnosis, such as an atypical vascular response. So these are patients who we say have white dermatographism. You know, you kind of can scratch them with um, a little a cotton tip applicator, and instead of getting this, uh, this typical red dermatographism or pink dermatographism, it actually blanches and stays blanched. They can have facial pallor or periorbital pallor and the delayed blanch response. Keratosis pilaris is also a common feature. That's when you get keratin plugging, especially on the lateral aspects of the arms. Pityriasis alba is another clue. That's when you get hypopigmented um, xerotic patches on the cheeks. You can have hyperlinear palms or ichthyosis in dry skin. Ocular and periorbital changes do occur, or can occur rather, in atopic dermatitis such as anterior, posterior, subcapsular cataracts. Uh, atopic patients can get conjunctivitis and keratoconus. And also they can get periorbital skin changes, such as they can get uh, hi periorbital hyperpigmentation or pallor. They can also get regional findings such as pequilitis or you know, changes to the, the skin on the lips or on the border of the lips. They can get ear, nipple, or hand, or plantar eczemas as well. Perifollicular accentuation, like kinification, excoriations, and parigo lesions as well. I think uh, one of the, there are criteria you can use to, to make the diagnosis for atopic dermatitis clinical criteria. And they're the Hannafin criteria. You should be able to find it pretty much in, in any text book chapter about atopic dermatitis. So what are some possible complications? Well, due to the impaired skin barrier, you can get infections. So bacterial infections are common, such as with staph or even strep, viral infections of the skin, such as eczema herpeticum, where the herpes virus can spread on eczema skin such as um, infants or children who have eczema on the cheeks. Let's say somebody kisses, gives them a kiss on their cheek because they're a cute baby, and then all of a sudden they end up with these blisters all over their cheeks. Fungi can also occur in atopic dermatitis as well. And so you just want to keep that in the back of your mind. If I, I would say the biggest thing to kind of keep, um, be, be aware of, with recalcitrant atopic dermatitis, where you do have crusting or oozing, is just make sure you don't have a bacterial super infection. It, you know, whether or not it's kind of the chicken or the egg with some forms of eczema, uh, you know, that that's still being elucidated. But we do know that when somebody predisposed to eczema gets a staph infection, their eczema flares. And oftentimes when you treat the infection, it gets better. That does not mean that you put all of your eczema patients on antibiotics because they have done research in that and it, it does not help. So you only treat an infection when it's there. Okay, so counseling, follow-up, and management. We have a lot of ground to cover um, and I apologize for kind of talking fast. So you want to counsel your patients on avoiding known triggers and exacerbating factors. So if you know that they're not bathing correctly, you want to counsel them on dry skin care precautions. So using gentle cleansers, not taking very hot showers, limiting the frequency of bathing. You know that the case we had, the patient was bathing twice a day using Irish Springs. Those are two big no-nos. You you know, we don't have, um, right now, we 
different people suggest different things for bathing, but you definitely want to nip over bathing in the bud. And you also want to make sure they're using gentle cleansers. So something like a Cetaphil or CeraVe or a Dove Unscented, only use cleanser in the areas that they actually need it. Uh, use lukewarm water to bathe with, and then use a very bland emollient after showering. Uh, avoid any irritants. This can include, in some people, you know, laundry detergents. We may sometimes even recommend they adjust that or adjust how they, they launder their clothes if we're concerned about detergents irritating their skin. Uh, sweating, if you know that sweat is something that exacerbates your patient, just recommend keeping cool. And environmental allergens. So some people do have known environmental allergens that cause them to flare and also infection prevention. So this is sometimes what we, when we do bleach baths and uh, that's something that we may recommend for patients who are predisposed to getting infections and then having their infections cause an eczema flare. Depending on the climate, you know, moisturizing with the appropriate skincare products. Um, we talked about kind of bathing recommendations, avoiding fragrances and dye are important especially if you know they have sensitivities. Not everyone has sensitivity, so but we typically uh, have a blanket recommendation just to kind of avoid any confusion. Uh, any emollients applied to damp skin, it will, it will help. So like any, well, I shouldn't say any emollient, but a thick, bland emollient applied directly to damp skin is better than applying it to dry skin. Also, we know that our eczema patients, because they're so paritic, sometimes they have sleep disruption. And they also, because of that, that could lead to, an, you know, if they're in school, that could cause, you know, educational changes and stuff. So you do want to assess for their sleep loss and see if they're getting good night, good night's rest. Also, an increased rate of mental health comorbidity, such as anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation have been found in this population. And even ADD. Management of atopic dermatitis will involve treatment of coexisting comorbidities such as ocular findings or allergic findings or the psychiatric disorders. Now, the psychiatric disorders, not all of your patients are going to have that, but you do want to screen for it. And if they have it, you want to be able to send them to the right place. So. Okay, and although there is no known cure for atopic dermatitis, the condition can be managed and we can improve the quality of life, which is very important. So you wanna counsel on this. You wanna counsel that this is going to be a chronic condition. You wanna counsel about sleep disruption. You wanna counsel about steroid phobia. I do feel like a lot of parents are afraid of using topical steroids. And so you just have to counsel them on it to, and you know just be available to them to, to address any of their concerns. You want to counsel on the comorbidities of asthma and allergic rhinitis should your patients uh, present with any of these. And then also having tiered therapy for flares is very important. So, you know, if you have kind of explaining to the parents or to the patient, if you have just um, dry skin, going ahead and just increasing your emollient use. If you notice that it's a little pruritic, you know, maybe starting with one type of topical steroid. If it's, a, you know, you're getting a full-blown eczema flare, maybe using this other type of topical steroid. If you're concerned about infection, you need to call our clinic, things like that. Using your skin hydration efforts is very important and constantly counseling on that. Reducing and eliminating tr triggers or exacerbating allergens. You know, some patients have known flare flare points or triggers, and not everyone has the same trigger. So it's very important to discern what's actually causing your patient to flare. And I do think in some cases, you may even consider patch testing in certain patients. So it's not uncommon that somebody will use an emollient and it works wonderfully for them for years, and all of a sudden they say it's turning on them. Well, it could be that they're actually getting sensitized to one of the ingredients in it. We used to think that atopic dermatitis, you um, necessarily you weren't necessarily getting allergic contact dermatitis because of the different <clears throat> immune skewing of it. But we're seeing now that some patients actually are becoming sensitized to certain products. And so you can maybe help them weed that out from their ingredient list. Um, application of topical anti-inflammatory medications. We have a few classes, topical steroids, calcineurin inhibit inhibitors, CDE4 inhibitors, chrysoborol is one that you've heard of. Uh, wet dressings or pajama therapy or another um, type of thing that you can counsel on. Uh, Anti-itch measures, 
staying cool, you know, don't use alcohol on an itchy spot. That makes it worse. Things like that. Using a cold compress, antibacterial measures as needed. So dilute bleach baths, such as using a quarter cup of, you know, unconcentrated old school plain bleach in a standard bath, a half bathtub of water. Sometimes some people use topical antibiotics as needed. We also have different tiers of therapy. So when somebody gets around 10% body surface area or higher, sometimes we consider phototherapy or systemic medications. And so systemic treatments can be used when you have that kind of extensive disease and you know you're not going to be able to capture it using just your topicals. Dupilimab is the, the biologic that was kind of first in its class for atopic dermatitis. It blocks interleukin-4 and 13 signaling, and it's approved for adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis who can't be controlled with more conservative measures. Antihistamines more have a role in sedating patients to be able to sleep or managing their comorbidities. They've done research, and we haven't quite seen that antihistamine use as in and of itself is necessarily helpful for the eczema, but it can help your patient sleep and it can help their allergic rhinitis. Systemic antibiotics are only indicated when you have an infection. We try to avoid systemic steroids because there is a risk of rebound flares. Now, depending on who you talk to, different dermatologists have different opinions about that. That is kind of a, a a hot subject uh, and everyone practices differently, but in general, we do try to avoid systemic steroids, especially if you're just using that to treat the eczema. You need to use it very cautiously because when they rebound, what are you gonna do? So you need to have a, a game plan for that. Low-dose methotrexate is an option. It's also sometimes used for psoriasis. And you know we have a lot of history with methotrexate. I think most dermatologists feel very comfortable prescribing it, but it does have risks and it does need very frequent monitoring. And at higher doses, methotrexate is a chemotherapeutic agent. And so we're not using it at chemotherapy doses. We're kind of using it at you know a lower weekly dose, not a daily dose. It's just a weekly dose. And that requires very close counseling. Now, there is an excellent paper that I think everybody who is on this webinar should read if they're trying to treat patients with atopic dermatitis. Our Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology has atopic dermatitis guidelines that were published in 2014. It's a multi-part guideline, so it's not, it's going to be, if you look it up on the, um, on your library's website, you're going to see that it's multiple articles, but it goes into depth about how how we should treat our eczema patients and kind of the tier therapy that and how you should approach it. So these are our references. Um, I appreciate your time in listening to this webinar. I think we have a few minutes for any questions. And Leslie, I'll actually let you kind of take the screen over if that's okay. Sure, we're we're doing that right now. Okay, thank you. I have a question about gentle emollients. Oh, yeah. So, oh, uh, okay. So what's the question? Well, Just what my, are they? You no, know, no, no. I, my patients oh. are, my patients are um, impoverished, poor. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm wondering if just straight Vaseline can be used. Uh, As an emollient? Yep. Yes. Or, okay. So vas. Okay. So. As a cleanser or emollient or both? Uh, as an emollient. Okay, okay, perfect. I do have some people who ask me about Vaseline like as a cleanser. And, uh, I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, but as an emollient, it is the gold standard. You know, it, I think it's outstanding as an emollient. I will rarely have somebody tell me, not that any, you, nobody should be getting allergic to just plain petrolatum but some people do feel like it doesn't necessarily alleviate the itch. Mm -hmm. And so as long as it is helping moisturize their skin and it's not making their itch worse, I say go for it. I think that's wonderful. And in a lot of the international countries, they've looked at using just different types of oils. You know, we have very expensive emollient formulations here. You know, we have some that include like ceramides and things like that. But when you look at a lot of the data that is researched for emollients, it is actually, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of these studies were done using just different types of oils. And what, what, kind, what kind of oils? 
well, some of them they would compare to see if any anything would make it better, but like like safflower oil and you know I'm I'm sure olive oil olive had a polycube. Yeah, I'm, uh, let me look that up and get back to you and see if I can find the exact studies. The olive oil, I don't remember reading anything on, but I'm sure they've researched that. And I had a friend who even did alligator oil. If you guys just want a Louisiana twist with that, <laughs> um, she did it as her senior research project. So, but and let, it, let and us it, get your email, and I will I will pull the oils, the different formulations of oils that have been researched. And if there's a combination of both uh, pruritus uh, and and dryness. Uh, is there a uh, calamine lotion? Can that be used for pruritus and then Vaseline on top of it? I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to figure out a recipe that's affordable and effective. Okay. So I'm not a huge fan of calamine lotion because it does have a drying effect on the skin. Right. Um, right. I do know some people do like it. I don't find that it's particularly useful, uh, maybe yeah. for weepy lesions, kind of back when people use Domoboro as well. Yeah. I think if you're looking for itch control and um, you're looking, you know, hydrocortisone is the lowest topical strength and over the counter topical steroid that does alleviate itch in some people. You know, there are itch lotions that contain um, menthol in it, which I would caution because this population, you know, may have sensitive skin to certain ingredients like that. So you, you could use it in caution if you just have an itchy patient, uh -huh. not necessarily with severe eczema. And also, there's also uh, formulations like with promoxine in it, which can help uh -huh. itch. Sometimes we recommend you can just stick your emollient in the fridge. It'll be nice and cold and you can apply it then. Um, you know, so there's different things you can use. Everyone, I think every dermatologist has their different tricks. Okay. I like uh, cold compresses to break the itch cycle because I feel that that's, that's very useful. Cold can stop itch. Oh. So. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions? Looks like that might be it, question-wise. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Sadegian, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great presentation. Well, thank you, Leslie, for all of your help, and thank you for putting on this Visual DX clinical education series. Very helpful. Thank you. I, pre I appreciate it. You're thank welcome. Thank you, everybody. All bye -bye. right. Bye.